welcome to your Charleston County Library. Thank you. Thank you to the Land Trust. If y'all need the restroom, this is it right here. The switch is on the outside, so don't anybody turn it off on anybody, because kids love to do that. I know y'all can do it. I'll try not to do it. Yep. <laughs> um, the good thing is, when we get refreshed, these bookcases will be against the wall. So this will never happen again. <laughs> Unless we have double this, then yeah. there's an issue. I'm apparently pretty popular. Yeah, apparently. So, I had no I, idea. so does anybody object to having a picture taken? Because I just got to prove that we had this many people in this building. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to believe just a bad you know, just be saying we had it. Yeah. And thank you, Tom, for doing this. I'm so excited sure to hear what you have to say. All righty, everyone, it's 4 o'clock, so might as well get started. We have a packed house. I'm going to try and yell. Hopefully my voice doesn't go out. Uh, I was just saying earlier, um, I tend to give um, really poor rambly um, presentations when it gets past 3 o'clock, so y'all are in for a treat. Um, but um, I've got a lot to cover today, packed into a short number of slides and half as much time as I need to cover it all. Um, so I'm going to try and blow through all of this. This is an in incredibly deep topic. Um, with a lot of rabbit holes, and I have a bad tendency of going down rabbit holes, so bear with me here. But um, it's front-loaded, so it's going to take me most of the presentation to get through the first half, and then I'm going to just blow through the actual project I'm work working on on the latter half. Um, so we have a lot of background information we need to get into before we can get to the point um, where we can actually really, you know, learn about why, why the project that I'm working on for the land trust at the Hutchinson House is significant to the island. Um, but before we get into that, you're probably wondering who this madman is rambling up here and why Terry let her in. Um, so um, I, I have a bachelor's in wildlife and fisheries biology. I'm a professional conservationist and ecologist for the Edison Island Open Land Trust. Uh, I'm also an avid expert naturalist. Um, I'm apparently a sucker as well because people keep electing me president of things. Um, and I can't say no. Um, uh, I'm an independent researcher, which is a, a fun way of saying that no one will pay me to do research, so I do it as a hobby. Uh, and I'm also a soon-to-be author. Uh, and uh, additionally pertinent, this is the first time I've given this talk on Edisto from a PowerPoint, I'm also an 11th generation Edistonian. My great-great-grandmother is buried right out here in the cemetery. So, um, and some quick disclaimers. Um, you, you may have noticed that I did not list historian, farmer, or horticulturalist anywhere on that prior slide. That's because I'm none of those things. Um, I'm, I'm researching and learning about this project as I go along, uh, so take everything I say here with a fistful of salt. Um, I'm learning as I go, I'm flying by the seat of my pants, and I'm learning every single day. Um, and so if you see anything on here that is, that is off or wrong, or you think you have a better source for it, please email me and let me know, because I probably have no idea. Um, <laughs> additionally, uh, the backbone of all of this research is Dr. Porsche's 2005 book, The Story of Sea Island Cotton. It is a phenomenal treatise on the subject, um, so if you want to know the the full ins and outs about the story of Sea Island Cotton and every single excruciating detail, pick up a copy and pour over it. It's a fantastic book. Um, I've also pulled in a lot of information from other primary and secondary sources along the way, but this is a, I just finished this PowerPoint four months ago and it's been a very busy four months and I haven't gotten to the point where I've put citations in it, so I don't have any citations in here, so just, just trust me. Um, eventually I'll get to that one day. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't tell you who the Land Trust is, because I work for them. Um, we are Edisto Island's local land trust. Uh, we work to keep Edisto Edisto. We work to preserve um, the, the lands, the waterways, the natural resources, the culture, the traditional land uses, and the history of Edisto Island. Primarily, we do that through private land conservation. Um, particularly, voluntary conservation easements are the, the big thing that we use to conserve land here on Edisto Island. Um, we also run community conservation projects, which is where um, uh, we undertake projects that um, meet both the needs of our community as well as the, the conservation of natural resources or other environmental features of Edisto Island. And one of those is the Hutchinson House, which was built circa 1885 by Henry Hutchinson, and the land was purchased by his father, James Hutchinson, in 1875. And this is just down the road on Point of Pines Road. Um, it was added to the Historic Register in 1987, um, and we and in 2016, the property came up for sale in the open market. The Edison Island Open Land Trust was able to buy it, and um, we've been working with the family hand in hand in order to interpret its history and to preserve and restore the house. Uh, in 2019, we were able to purchase the adjacent lot with funding from the Charleston County Greenbelt Program. And in 2024, just last month, we started the next phase of restoration of the house, so we're putting the porches uh, back on it. Um, so it's, you see up here, the 
This one right here, that's what the house looks like right now. And this is a 3D rendering of what we're going to uh, restore the house to here, hopefully before the end of the year. And soon the property will be open to the public as a public green space in a historic site. Um, don't have a firm ETA on that. Permitting is takes forever. Uh, and it's taken us eight months to get the permits just to put porch on it. So I don't know how long it's gonna take us to be able to get the trails in. Um, but we'll get there eventually. Um, additionally, um, I gotta tell you why the Hutchinson House is an, an important landmark and feature and historic site on Edisto Island. And that's because of the Hutchinson family. So James, who went by Jim Hutchinson, um, was a Civil War veteran, a farmer, a social activist, a politician, and an entrepreneur here on Edisto Island during the Reconstruction era, immediately following the Civil War. Um, he also significant to note for um, this overarching story, and we'll get into that later, he also co-founded the first Black-owned steamboat company on Edisto Island. If you didn't know, didn't know it, um, Edisto Island didn't have a road until the 1920s. There was no bridge coming to the island. Everything came on and off the island by boat. So owning your own steamboat ferry company was instrumental for him to uh, be able to, to ship and move crops on and off the island to, um, you had to do anything in order to, to run a business or make money on Edisto Island. You had to have a boat and you had to have a way to move things by water. Um, uh, James also organized at least two um, uh, Freedmen Land Co-op, uh, cooperative purchases on the island to buy out plantations that were up for foreclosure. Um, everyone who, who paid into the co-op was able to, um, everyone who, sorry. <laughs> Lost my train of thought. Um, everyone who was able to buy into the co-op um, got a proportional share of whatever property they bought. So if the property was $1,000 and someone put in 100 bucks, they got 10% of the property, that kind of thing. So he was able to organize at least two that we know of on Edisto Island, one of those being the property where the Hutchinson House is, was built. Um, sadly, uh, James was shot and killed on the 4th of July, 1885, by a white man from Wamla named James Barth. Um, he was detained tried and accused of manslaughter that same year, but he was acquitted by a white jury the following year. Um, it's a shame. Uh, um, that, that same year as well, Henry Hutchinson built the Hutchinson House on the property, um, and I forgot to mention, James, James was killed at Clark Manor, which is the ruins of which are still there immediately next to where the Hutchinson House was built. Um, but uh, his son, Henry Hutchinson, built the Hutchinson House, and he spent the rest of his life farming the lands around it uh, and he primarily grew Sea Island cotton. That was the, the core around um, his, his entire business was, was growing, processing, shipping, and selling Sea Island cotton. And he ran an agricultural co-op for his entire community, for the entire Clark community surrounding the Hutchinson House. And that was, um, that was key to his success and the success of his community because um, by running the by running a gin house and running this co-op, he was able to consolidate loans. He owned the gin house. He had full ver vertical integration from field to when it arrived at the factory, or arrived at the warehouse in Charleston. So he cut out all of the middlemen, all of the prejudice against black grown cotton along the way. And he was able to get a, a higher price per bale for himself and everyone around him because of this. Additionally, because he was processing this cotton in bulk and shipping it in bulk and packing it in bulk, he was able to grade the cotton at a finer scale, which meant that it was worth a much higher um, price at market because he was able to sort it between the lower grades and the finest grades that he had. Um, and so he was competing with you know, Bleak Hall and Seabrook and all the other plantations on Edisto Island and Johns Island right there every single year, delivering the first finest bale of cotton to market. Um, and the, the story of the Hutchinson family doesn't end with Henry either. Um, I'm not going to go into everyone. It's a very long list. but. Um, Henry's two daughters, Lula and Mabel, uh, they were school teachers for, on Edisto Island. Lula taught um, school here on Edisto Island for 55 years, so she taught three or four generations of Edistonians. Um, additionally, the family uh, just started the Hutchinson Heritage Foundation last year, so they have their own 501c3 now that we're working with. We're just on a call with them and Denzel a couple of minutes ago, planning an event. Um, we're working hand in hand with them, and the Hutchinson Heritage Foundation is preserving the collective history of the Hutchinson family to include the Hutchinson House. Um, now, the link between the Hutchinson House and the Sea Island Cotton is, is, is tangible and it's firm. Um, sea Island Cotton is important to Edisto Island history, it's important to low country history, the history of the Sea Islands, and the history of South Carolina as a whole. Its profitability fueled the location plant, or low country plantation economy and it set the political stage for the Civil War, which depended on Charleston Harbor to ship goods and to ship Sea Island Cotton, which is what was bringing cash into the state. Um, 
Additionally, Sea Island cotton was grown here on the Sea Islands for 150 years. Most people have only ever heard about the first half of its history, which is when it was grown during the antebellum period on plantations by the enslaved. Uh, from 1790 to 1860, in the, eight, the Civil War period, 1860 to 1865, was fuzzy. Certain areas like Edisto Island, um, uh, cotton was being grown by people on the island for their own use or for the, naval, or for the Union forces, um, whereas other parts of the state, it continued to be grown uh, under the, the plantation use uh, for the Confederacy. Um, at the Edison Island Open Land Trust for the Hutchinson House Project, we're looking to tell the second half of that story from 1865 to 1940, when Sea Island cotton was grown by freedmen farmers on the Sea Islands, on Edison Island, by folks like Jim and, and Henry Hutchinson for their own financial gain. Um, Jim, Jim sought economic success um, for his family and for um, his community members by getting their hands on land where they could grow sea island cotton to earn money to improve their standard of living to get their children educations um, to and it uh, he was doing this at the community scale as well so he was elevating he was using sea island cotton as a tool um, to get to improve the lives of, of his entire community and his entire island um, henry's livelihood um, his entire life was spent growing sea island cotton by, by basing his entire business around it and um, providing income for not just his own family, but for the entire community around him in the Clark community area. It, it is an inseparable piece of the Hutchinson family history. I'm going to take a drink real quick. So you may be wondering, what in the world is Sea Island Cotton? Well, Sea Island Cotton is a, an improved day neutral flowering cultivar of the tropical and perennial um, long staple cotton. Um, long staple cotton is an entirely different species than upland cotton. I'm sure many of y'all are familiar with the upland cottons that are grown in the Midlands of South Carolina to this day. Totally different species, completely unrelated. <clears throat> sea island cotton is derived from a totally separate species of cotton that, that originated in the Andes Mountains of um, South America. Upland cotton is native to Central America and Mexico. Um, the, the two have some morphological differences as well that, that you can use to easily tell them apart. Um, uh, up, or sea island cotton is a much larger plant. It lacks hairs on its stems. That's actually the scientific name for upland cotton. Recipient hirsutum means hairy cotton. Um, it's covered from head to toe in fuzz. Um, sea island cotton is not. As you can see right here, all these photos are sea island cotton. They're just shiny, smooth plants the whole way across, well, other than the length, of course. Um, they have a teardrop shaped fruit rather than more of a spherical shaped fruit in upland cotton. They have five lobed leaves. Um, <clears throat> upland cotton tends to just have three lobe leaves. There is some muddling between the two. Um, the fibers are, of course, longer and finer in sea island cotton. That's what made it so sought after as a cash crop. Uh, the flowers of sea island cotton are pastel yellow. Um, upland cotton, they tend to be more pink and white. Um, sea island cotton is incredibly picky about its soil and climate um, that it needs. And it has uh, black, smooth, hard seeds. That is a, a key difference between all the long staples and all the upland cottons. It also plays into how the two are ginned and separately processed and why these two crops were grown in parallel in different locations and there was not overlap or muddling between the areas where these two were grown. Um, uh, important uh, about the, the picky soil and climate, um, Sea Island cotton needs a long growing season. It needs fertile, well-drained, sandy soils and it needs a humid climate. And we have all of that on Edisto, especially the, the hot and humid part. Um, <laughs> and so that's why it thrived on the Sea Islands of South Carolina and Georgia was because of the climate, because of the relatively new, fresh, fertile soils, um, and the humidity as well, the sea breeze. Um, it's, the sea breeze um, keeps the humidity high, but it also it keeps the, the heat of the summer down a little bit, and it keeps the cold of the winter up a little bit. It really stabilizes and makes it practically a subtropical climate here on the islands, which the tropical sea island cotton, which is derived from the tropical long staple cotton, did really well in. Um, and further down the coast, it does just fine in Florida. It just happened to be that the logistics of growing it worked out best here in the Sea Islands of South Carolina and um, uh, North Georgia. Um, the fiber itself, um, the fibers of Sea Island cotton were about twice as long and about twice as fine as that of upland cotton. Um, so you can see up here, this is one of the ones I grew um, that is about one and nine sixteenths in length, so over an inch and a half in length. Um, upland cottons at the time were about three quarters of an inch. They've improved those uh, significantly now. They're now closer to an inch, but and they've improved long staple cottons as well. Um, but at the time, you were getting a fiber that was twice as long and half as fine, but it retained pretty much all of the same strength. 
So these could be woven or spun into incredibly fine, incredibly strong threads that were used um, not just for <coughs> luxury items. Most people know about it, its use um, uh, by the European aristocracy for uses in fine laces and fine muslins. It also, uh, sea island cotton was also prized for its utility for engineering applications during um, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, they used it to sew together um, airplane skins and parachutes in, in World War I, hot air balloons, parachute cords. Um, it was used in the first bias ply tires in the first cars. It was used for high RPM drive belts. You could make a belt that was half the weight and thus could spin twice as fast but had just as much strength because you had finer, lighter fiber. And so it, had, it wasn't just used by the ro but for royalty, for high-end luxury clothing. It also had practical applications all the way up into you know, World War I. Um, <clears throat> I need to time these water drinks better. But so during the antebellum period, um, sea island cotton was grown at the plantation scale, and it was the dominant crop. Um, one thing that people don't think about with, with sea island cotton is that it was it was the most abundant plant on Edisto Island for about 150 years. I want you to think about that. There was more, more cotton on the island than grass. The only thing that rivaled it was, you know, Spartina out in the marsh. Um, practically every freshwater wetland was ditched, diked, and drained in order to dry the soil for sea island cotton. And thousands of acres of salt marsh were diked and desalinated in order to grow sea island cotton. They had every possible arable inch of land on this island planted in cotton. Um, with, with the harvesting of sea island cotton, uh, it started in August and it lasted all the way through December until the first frost. Uh, first frost was sooner back then. It was usually um, before Christmas, um, but they the plant produced and they picked it until the frost killed it. Um, it what, it's not like modern cottons where they grow the cotton to a certain point and then they defoliate it and then they come through and they mechanically harvest it. It just kept produce. The, it was put in the ground and you know it, about April or so and they they worked and they tilled and they harvested it all the way until the next frost. Then they spent the winter preparing the fields, and then the cycle repeated. Um, sea Island cotton also had a very specific processing um, uh, procedure that it had to go through. It had to be dried, it had to be sorted, it had to be whipped, ginned, molded, packed, and shipped. And that basically just means they had to they had to get all the moisture out of it. They had to clean it all out. They had to um, fluff up the cotton and get all the the sand and other particles that were um, that had um, been had gotten clogged into the fiber through, you know, just wind blowing sand around. Then they had to run it through a gin. Then they had to go through and they had to clean everything else that they missed. Then, the, then they had to pack it into, you know, um, waxed hemp bags. And they had to load it up and ship it to Charleston. Um, and that's, um, oh, let's hold up. So um, a key thing to note here is that sea island cotton had to be processed on a roller gin. I'm sure all of y'all have heard about, you know, Eli Whitney inventing the cotton gin. I've got a bone to pick with that in the next slide, I think. Um, but, but that was a completely different type of gin, and uh, sea island cotton required a, a much older, uh, more um, archaic type of gin in order to process it. Um, and then all that, that cotton, the, the plantations and the freemen, they were not selling that cotton themselves. They were selling it to a factor in Charleston who was then selling it on the global market. So the factor was kind of a combination between a stockbroker and a banker. So they would provide a loan to the farmer, the, the farmer would use that loan to buy you know, fertilizer, horseshoes, wagon wheels, whatever they needed to do to run their farm. And then they would pay off that loan with bales of cotton at the end of the year. And any excess they planted beyond the amount of the loan, the factor would then buy it from them at you know, a fixed rate or a negotiable rate. And then the factor would take all of that, that cotton, put it in their warehouse, and then they would game the global cotton market like it was the stock market and try and maximize their profit. Um, and that's how they made their money off of the, off of the loan. If they couldn't repay the loan, then they had to pay. Then, you know, of course, there was interest. You know how bankers are. Um, so, bone I have to pick is that Eli Whitney did, did not invent the cotton gin. He invented a cotton gin. He invented the saw gin. Um, sea Island cotton was gin on a roller gin. This was invented back, you know, about 500 to 1380. They don't quite know when the first one was back in India. Um, roller gins are pretty much just. You can just think of it as two rolling pins sitting on top of each other that are being you know, spun by some sort of um, uh, mechanical power system. 
Um, and so these two rollers would spin against each other and you would feed the cotton in, the fiber would get pinched between the two rollers, pulled off, and then the seed would fall out of the front. Um, you can't do that with upland cotton. Um, sea island cotton, you can get away with that because the, the fiber is just, it's just barely attached to the seed. The seed is hard, it's large. Um, the fiber just pulls right off of the seed and the seed falls away. In upland cotton, that fiber is glued right onto the outside of uh, that cotton seed. It's a smaller seed. It's covered from head to toe in fuzz. If you feed it into a roller gin, it just smashes it and kicks it out the other side. Um, what a saw gin does is it's basically a hook and a comb. And it would, the hook would grab the cotton fiber, pull it through the comb, the seed would stay on the other end, and it would pull the fiber through. You put sea island cotton through a saw gin, it would grab the fiber, rip it in half, and spit out the world's most expensive upland cotton on the other side. So there's <laughs> absolutely no reason you would ever want to gin sea island cotton on a saw gin, because it just totally ruined the, the entire, you know, um, the, the, the luxury, it, it would just it cut the fiber in half, so. <laughs> um, so sea island cotton, it's, it's, a, its origin is a little unknown, but what they do know that it was developed um, here on the sea islands of Georgia and South Carolina sometime before 1790. Um, it likely originated from a strain of Caribbean plants. Um, there were long staple cottons that were grown by the, the Native Americans on the Caribbean islands. Uh, for their own personal use. These were perennial tropical plants. They would just have a plant and, they would, and it would grow um, pretty much like a hibiscus. Um, so these, these plants would grow practically into a tree and they'd just come out every year and pick the cotton off of it and use it for their own spinning and weaving. Um, so they took these perennial uh, tropical plants, they brought them here to South Carolina, and then they just, through brute force, kept growing them until they found plants that didn't care what time of year it was and just flowered as soon as they got big enough. Um, so on a previous slide, I said something about day neutrality. So with tropical plants, the tropics don't have winter, spring, summer, and fall. They have wet and dry. So the plants are timed based off of photo period, you know, where the sun is in the sky, how long a day is pretty much. And they time that on when they bloom, or at least some of them. One of those being long staple cotton. So if you plant long staple cotton here in South Carolina, not Sea Island cotton, just the original long staple cotton, it waits until about October to start blooming. And then it freezes a, freezes a month and a half later, and it takes two months for the seeds to mature. So they would plant these plants and they wouldn't flower. They would just hold off, they grow, they look great, and then they'd wait till the last second to start flowering, and then they'd freeze and they wouldn't produce a crop. And so they just kept doing it, and apparently they eventually found some that just didn't care, and they grab, grabbed onto that strain. It's not really well documented, and that's what became Sea Island Cotton. And from there, um, on Johns Island and Edisto Island, they improved um, that cultivar to the point where it would grow a longer, finer fiber, it would have more fiber per bowl, they really made it a marketable crop. Um, and then in the early 1800s, there was a gold rush like scramble all across the Sea Islands to convert every acre possible into cotton fields and grow as much cotton as physically possible. Very early on in the, you know, the early 1800s, the 1700s, the focus was on growing the, the, the finest fiber, the longest fiber possible. But uh, as they started to really work out the kinks on the, you know, the quality of the cotton they were growing, it shifted to just raw volume um, by the middle of, or by the early to mid 1800s. Um, and then um, during the, the Civil War, Sea Island cotton production practically ceased on the Sea Islands. Um, much of the Sea Islands, to include Edisto Island, were evacuated by the white population. And so um, Sea Island cotton was still being grown in spots around the coast either by the Union or by the Confederacy as a means to generate cash, but at scale it just plummeted. Um, following the Civil War, it continued to be grown extensively all across the Sea Islands to, you know, um, people weren't planting it in the salt marsh anymore, but you know, every arable land that was every bit of arable land that wasn't being grow, used to grow food or to uh, pasture cows, it was being used to grow Sea Island cotton because that was the way to generate cash at the time. Um, a lot of it was grown underneath the plantation sharecropping system, but here on Edisto, a lot of cotton was being grown by independent freemen farmers, like Jim and Henry. Um, and by the, the late 1800s, the profitability from Sea Island cotton started to wane. Um, Egypt had imported Sea Island cotton seeds and used, and used those seeds to create hybrids that they now, they were, which then became the, the progenitors to the modern Egyptian cotton, which is a direct descendant of Sea Island cotton. Um, and they were able to outcompete the southeastern U.S. Uh, to get the basically the the cheap luxury cotton market, and so they were competing and taking away um, 
they were they were causing causing the pricing to degrade for anyone who wasn't producing the finest cotton here in the, the, the low country of South Carolina. And about that same time where Egypt started to overtake um, the Southeast as far as the, the total amount of long staple cotton produced, the boll weevil arrived in the low country. I'm sure you've heard about the boll weevil. Um, it's a native species to Central America that naturally evolved to eat um, upland cotton. So upland cotton is, is, is naturally resistant to the damage of the boll weevil. It has a built-in immunities and responses to it. Sea island cotton does not. The boll weevil does not exist where long staple cotton is native. And um, we did not have the boll weevil here in the United States until the 1890s. As we expanded westward down the coast and started extending the cotton belt all the way to Texas, the boll weevil jumped the Rio Grande Valley and took off like a wildfire down the, the eastern seaboard. Uh, and by 1918, it was here on Edisto Island. And by the mid-1920s, the entire long staple um, industry, the entire long staple cotton industry was decimated. Um, sorry. Um, the the boll weevil feeds on the inside of the seed, and so it cuts up the fiber as, it's, as the, the larvae is worming its way around the bowl feeding. And so with upland cotton, you're still able to harvest some of that lint out of there and still make some kind of product out of it. But with Sea Island cotton, it was just absolutely destroyed. And so the fiber was cut up, rotten, and there were the plants would otherwise be healthy. But um, at, the, at the end of the day, when it came time to harvest, there would be nothing there to harvest, nothing there to gin, nothing there to package, no profit gotten from all of these plants that you've just grown the entire year. Um, and about that same time on Edisto Island, farmers switched from Sea Island cotton to truck cropping. We grew cabbages and potatoes, and we loaded those up on trains or up on the steamboats and shipped them to Charleston, up north to New York uh, for markets, and eventually to tomatoes. And y'all know the story. Um, uh, in the in the 1930s, um, the USDA made made a, a valiant effort to try and revive um, the Sea Island cotton industry in the southeastern United States. Um, they, they were trying to breed boll weevil resistant strains of long staple cottons and get those and produce enough seeds and buy enough seeds from the, the plantations that were still able to produce seeds on the sea islands to get them into the hand of independent freedmen farmers in the, um, the coastal plain of Georgia as well as North Florida. Um, there was a fairly vast area that they distributed these seeds through, but logistically it all fell apart. The, the strains were not resistant enough to the boll weevil for it to really be worthwhile. And there were people growing upland cotton right next to people growing sea island cotton. So after one year, he ended up with hybrid plants that were worse off than either of them. And so there was no way for them to separate the seeds and separate them on the gin. You take, you know, you, you take your sea island cotton to the gin and you get a bag back and the bag would be, you know, 10% upland cotton. You plant that in your field and your entire crop next year would be, your entire seed crop for the next year would be ruined because of all the hybridization in your field. So it eventually fell apart. Um, but uh, so they, they instead decided to, to really focus on creating a, an improved hybrid strain of cotton that could be that would have the best qualities of sea island cotton as well as the resistances of upland cotton. And they started doing that research uh, in the late 1930s at the Florence um, research or the PD research station in Florence, South Carolina. Um, uh, they eventually gave up on that and they shifted to just trying to, you know, um, get Sea Island cotton genes into upland cotton to try and give it some of the better fiber quality. They moved shop to Johns Island in the, the early, I think 1939 until about 1942. And they gave up on that and they just moved everything over to Georgia, I think Macon, Georgia, and started really just focusing on improving upland cotton. Um, uh, and at that point, the cultivation of pure Sea Island cotton seed, at least at scale, or the cultivation of pure Sea Island cotton, at least at scale, um, in the continental United States ceased. It was still probably grown, you know, at smaller scales by small farmers, but the, the market stopped. Um, however, there, there is at least a silver lining. Upland cotton was not destroyed by the bull weevil. Um, it continued to be grown at reduced profitability all throughout, but in the 1970s, the USDA, again, they created an initiative to eradicate the bull weevil from the United States. And by some miracle, they actually managed to do it. Um, by but through a series of quarantining fields and paying farmers to not grow cotton for a certain period of time, um, they were the, since the boll weevil can only eat cotton if they just removed cotton from the landscape and then allowed enough time to pass that all that every boll weevil would go through its natural cycle and die off. 
there was now no longer any more boll weevils in that area. The boll weevil can only last about two to three years and die a in the soil. Then after that point, they all expire. So they would eradicate all the cotton from a certain area, have no one plant it, get rid of all the rogue plants growing in the ditches, wait a couple of years, and they reintroduce cotton and the boll weevil would be gone. And they did this systematically all the way down the East Coast. And by 2009, they'd eradicated the boll weevil from the entire United States, except for you know, Texas, right on the Rio Grande Valley. And they're still fighting that front to this day. Um, sea island cotton was not grown without consequences. Um, the production of sea island cotton, like all plantation cash crops, took an immeasurable toll on the lives of hundreds of thousands of enslaved men and women. Um, planner efforts to preserve the sea island cotton economy that was dependent on Charleston Harbor likely fueled the events that precipitated the Civil War and the shelling of Fort Moultrie. Um, sorry, Sumter. Um, sea island cotton also left an indelible mark on the on the geology, the hydrology, and the ecology of the sea islands of South Carolina, particularly on Edisto Island. Um, this island was practically scraped bare of trees. Every wetland was ditched and drained. Um, there were great expanses of high marsh that were converted into fields. Um, there's, there's still berms and ditches all throughout this island that are wreaking havoc um, from cotton cultivation. It's something, unlike rice fields, which are still there, they're very present, they're very tangible, they're easy to see, the scars of sea island cotton cultivation still exist innocuously um, in every acre of this island. Um, it, ha it has created um, certain species um, that I found in Buford or Johns Island or up in Megan are just gone from this island that should be here, just because this land was in cultivation for so long for this one crop. Um, sea island cotton, Cultivation left a lasting mark upon all facets of the low country. What am I doing on time? I'm actually making good time. Um, so with all that said, um, that provides us the invaluable historical context for sea island cotton, not just on Edisto Island, but in the entirety of the low country. Um, sea island cotton was a cash crop that was endemic to the sea islands of South Carolina and Georgia. It was grown nowhere else. This, this crop was grown just here on these islands. Um, it was also, like I said before, the most common upland plant on the sea islands for over a century. There was more cotton on this island than there was grass at one point. I want, you, I want that to sink in. Um, it, it was just as common as, as loblolly pines are today. Fun fact, fit, more than 50% of the trees in this state are loblolly pines. That's wild to think about. Um, and it wasn't like that before. Um, the, sea island, uh, the economy of all the sea islands that are revolved around the, the cultivation of this plant uh, millions of people spent their entire lives cultivating this crop. Many enslaved people suffered for it, and yet many freedmen also found prosperity with it. The very ground that we walk, maybe not at this church, but just outside there, um, was turned over countless times in pursuit of growing this plant. Um, the very landscape that we live in is still influenced by that scarring infrastructure from these cotton fields. And then just over the span of a few decades, it disappeared entirely from the, the whole of the low country. We cannot understand our past if we don't understand sea island cotton. Sea island cotton is that thread that stitches the long history of the low country together. And with that, I can finally start telling you about the project that I'm working on with the Edisto Island Open Land Trust at the Hutchinson House, reviving sea island cotton for the interpretation and demonstration of the history there. So back in 2016, we purchased the Hutchinson House off the open market. Um, and then we began fundraising to get the restoration underway. Uh, in 2017, I started working for the Land Trust, and that was about the same time that um, uh, we started doing our stabilizations on efforts on the house to keep it from collapsing. Um, in late 2017, we put a canopy over the house. That following January was the record eight inch snowfall. If we hadn't done that when we did, the house would have collapsed. Um, so we got in there at the nick of time and saved the house at the last possible second. Um, in late 2018, a man named Bill McLean from Charleston approached us and said he was growing a strain of true Sea Island cotton. Um, and he wanted to share some seeds with us for the Hutchinson House project. <coughs> um, and so I did not believe that for one second. Um, but after doing a bunch of research, which I'll show you in the next couple of, couple of slides, I think it actually is the real deal. Um, <laughs> And so in 2019, I was hired full-time to the Land Trust, and that's when I really started working on this project in full. Um, and I've been working on this project all throughout. So this will be five years now. Um, and in 2024, our restoration efforts are in full swing, and we're getting close to the finish line on the house. So the question, 
It was on everyone's mind. It was on my mind the entire way through this. Is, is this really Sea Island cotton? The answer is, is probably pretty good chance. Probably yes. Um, so I'm not, I, never say, I never say anything with a guarantee. It's always a probably. Um, so this is the, the sort of chain of the provenance that I have for my seed and where I, why I think that this is, in fact, genuine, pure Sea Island cotton that has not been hybridized with upland cotton. So this is a Ziploc bag I got from Bill in a parking lot back in 2018. Um, and this is where he got his seeds from. Over here, this is the National Plant Germplasm System, which is um, here in the, with these cotton seeds are, are um, managed by the USDA at their cotton collection in College Station, Texas. And so if we look at the date up here, and I'm sure y'all can't see this, but in July of 1939, the seeds that the USDA have ended up in their cryo storage facility. It was in, it was in, they were input into the USDA seed storage system in 1939. And the name of the strain was Bleak Hall Sea Island. If you know anything about Edisto Island history, you know that Bleak Hall Plantation is what is the beachfront on Botany Bay. If you know anything about Sea Island cotton history, you know that Bleak Hall was the premier producer of Sea Island cotton in the world. They produced the, the most cotton fiber and they were the largest distributor of cotton seeds throughout the entirety of the world. Anyone who, practically anyone in this area who didn't produce their own cotton seeds and they refreshed it every year, they bought seeds from Bleak Hall. Um, so it's no surprise that the USDA would have ended up with Bleak Hall seeds if they'd ended up with anything. And if we look over here at this publication from the USDA, from their, their um, from the research um, they were doing into uh, creating hybrid and improved strains of sea island cotton and upland cottons at the PD station in Florence, you can see that they maintained a bleak hall strain of sea island pure for back crossing that was, that was their baseline to um, hybridize any upland cotton that they were trying to create an improved variety of. So they were maintaining a pure strain of bleak hall, bleak hall cotton specifically for the purpose of having pure genetics in order to you know, continue and improve um, the, the hybrid cottons that they were working on. And then incredibly conveniently in 2001, someone did a genetic study and they happened to pick this strain of cotton for their genetic study and mapped. And this is a three dimensional graph down here that shows the interrelatedness of about 20 different strains of cotton. And they were trying to see how all of the long staple and upland cottons were related and which were hybrids and to what degree and what all the, you know, which ones were descended from which. If you look all the way down in this corner, Far removed from everything as it can be are two strains labeled Bleak Hall and Seabrook Sea Island. So not only, and, and so the next closest things that are related to it are Egyptian and Pima cottons. Egyptian cotton, as I just mentioned before, is a direct descendant of a hybrid of Sea Island cotton. Pima was derived from Egyptian cotton, so it in and of itself is also a direct descendant and a hybrid of Sea Island cotton. So it's no surprise that these would be related to it if these descendants of Sea Island cotton um, you know, are in fact descendants more than likely of bleak hall cotton itself. Um, and what's also surprising about this is that there is a second strain of sea island cotton in the USDA vault from Seabrook Plantation, which is also on Edisto Island. So of all the possible strains of sea island cotton that could have been preserved, two of them are from this island. And we believe they have been in USDA care in this storage, cryogenic storage for about 80 years now. Um, and they take the seeds out every 10 years and they're refreshing, so it's not 80 year old seeds that they have in here and there. But of all the places these seeds could have been found, it's just been sitting under the USDA's nose this entire time and everyone thought that this plant had gone extinct. And uh, the story I got from them is that they had all the records on it, handwritten index cards and they were in a shoe box and they were in Bill's office and they don't know where he left it. And so, <laughs> so this has just been here in, US, in the United States government's care this entire time. And so, you know, no reason it got lost. Um, so that's everything I just went through up here. Um, the seeds I got are um, a third generation seed. Bill got his seeds um, direct from the National Plant Germplasm System. They have it set up so that researchers can order seeds. Um, he's not a researcher, he ordered seeds, they sent it to him. I don't know how that happened, but he ended up with the seeds. Um, he grew some at Point of Pines Plantation. And again, coincidentally, just straight down the road from the Hutchinson house, because he's friends with Bernie Maybank. Um, the, the 
second crop that he produced, the seeds that he got from that, he worked with uh, James I or with the Charleston County Parks and Rec at the McLeod Plantation on James Island uh, to grow a small interpretive patch or a large interpretive patch of cotton there. Uh, and the seeds that he took from that, that's where I got the seeds where I started my project. Uh, they only grow about 25 plants at um, uh, McLeod Plantation now, uh, and that's because it is an incredible pain to grow these plants, um, <laughs> as I learned firsthand. <laughs> so. In 2019, my goals were simple. Don't kill all of them and get the fluffy white stuff, as well as some seeds. So I staked out a 25 by 25 foot plot at the Hutchinson House. I put up some deer fencing preemptively, and I followed all the historical accounts to the best detail that I could on how to grow this plant and the cultivation techniques that they did. And other than breaking up the sod initially with you know a rototiller on the back of a tractor, I did everything by hand. Um, so I, the first year was pretty much it was an experiment. I wanted to see how viable this was, see exactly what I got. I was going into it at this point thinking that there was just some random thing, some random strain of cotton that was absolutely not Sea Island cotton. I did all of that you know, pedigree research uh, throughout 2019, and I pretty much put all the dots together by about October of 2019. So going into this, I was just trying to figure out what I needed to do to best grow this plant, what it actually needed, you know, and just the, the best place to start was, you know, how it was grown for the last 150 years. Um, I also did some experimenting with irrigation and fertilization. It turns out plants like being fertilized and irrigated, so who would have thought? Um, but one thing that I was really suspicious of in Dr. Porsche's book, he lists that the plants, the seeds were planted four inches underground, which is absolutely absurd. You don't do that with anything but avocados. Um, so I also experimented with seed planting depth, um, and so I put seeds at two inches, an inch, a half inch, and a quarter inch, just to see whether or not that had any impact and which one was preferred. Um, so here I am forming the, the beds in the alleys out there at the house. I did really high beds the first year, the historical accounts and the few images that we have of Henry out in the fields, or the Hutchinson family out in their fields, pretty much all match up with this. They were about 18 inches from the bottom of the alley to the top of the bed, so about nine inches down and nine inches up. Um, and that really helped with clearing out the weeds um, mechanically you know, um, with, um, uh, traditional uses or traditional um, uh, weeding uses. Um, the soil out there was actually surprisingly really good. This is the best looking soil I've ever seen in South Carolina. You know, pretty much didn't need to do anything other than add some sulfur, some nitrogen, um, and a little bit of manganese and a little bit of boron. Um, and see how you know high tech I was. I was using roach killer and crushed up dental models for my my calcium and my boron. Um, <laughs> Uh, irrigation was through a hand pitcher pump. I don't recommend doing that if you have any other options. Um, <laughs> and by golly, the seeds germinated. Um, and so as I went through, I, I, would, I weeded around the plants while they were young in order to you know, um, keep the weeds from growing in and disturbing the roots and, and sucking soil and nutrition out. Um, but you know that, that field had not been planted in about 30 years, and the weeds were fierce. Um, <laughs> But eventually, I got the plants high enough um, that I was able uh, to. They were pretty much, you know, self-sustaining. I could just go through with a, you know, with a, with a machete or a weed eater once once a month and just take the top of the weeds off of all the roads and, and hand pull anything that was getting a little too aggressive. Um, but very slowly over the course of the year, they grew all the way up, and I eventually got the fluffy white stuff. So I succeeded in my original goals. And here's just a quick slide showing. Um, the development uh, of the plant. Um, so you start out with a, a square up here, which is just a fancy way of saying a flower bud, which then turns into a candle, which is just a fancier way of saying a very big flower bud. Um, and then the flower opens up, and it is they don't actually open up like a like an okra. They look a lot like okra when they're growing out in the field. Actually, that first year I had several people come up and ask me why I was growing okra out there. Um, but the flower looks a lot like an okra flower, but it just has this really deep beautiful crimson down at the bottom. Um, and they, they stay fairly closed up. Uh, they don't open up like a modern upland cotton does. Um, and you can see that in some of the historical um, illustrations of the plant as well. Uh, and then the bowl slowly matures. Actually, about the, the first four weeks, uh, the bowl grows to about its full size. And in the last <coughs> three weeks, it's, it spins maturing the seeds inside of it. It takes 47 to 56 days, seven to eight weeks for the, for the bowl to fully mature, dry out, open up. And, um, that's what the open bowls look like down there. 
And here we are. Here is the Sea Island cotton lint. I reached behind you over here. I actually brought some today. Um, so <laughs> this, is, this is about half of what I have. Um, it's not a very productive plant for reasons we'll get into, um, but split this up and pass it around. Please don't steal it. I don't have a lot. <laughs> but feel free to feel it, and please just feel the difference between this and, and a cotton ball. Cotton ball is scratchy. It's rough. You can use it as a scouring pad. This is like powdered silk, um, and it has this very this creamy, you know, peach, ever so slight lustrous peach color which is, uh, I'll have this afterwards if anyone, if anyone doesn't get it. It all gets stolen before it gets there. Um, but in the historical accounts of it, that, 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 that creamy color, that, that peachy color, that, that shine, that luster, that is something that, that's noted multiple times. Um, I even took the effort of putting this thing under a dissecting scope and actually put it up against upland cotton, and yes, it is in fact finer. I measured it. You're not the, not the greatest length. Like I said, one and nine sixteenths, they were, um, they were, um, some of them were, were pushing over one and three quarters at some point, um, but we were past one and a half, so it was extra long staple by definition. Does this have the seed in it? No. Um, I have slides on that. Um, uh, so in 2019, um, it turns out that uh, growing a novel heirloom crop comes with a lot of problems. Um, so uh, when I planted the, the seeds deeper in the ground, the ones that I actually planted deeper did worse, surprisingly. This, the Sea Island cotton has a big seed. It's like, it's like three okra seeds like stacked on top of each other. But they really wanted to be about a half inch underground. If I put them any deeper, they kind of got locked in the soil and they struggled to get out of it. Um, but just planting them fairly shallowly, um, they would germinate and come out fairly reliably and then you would just hill around the plant and just provide it a little bit more support. Um, uh, additionally, I had a, there's I had a couple years there, it's fairly consistent now. We have a drought in May, um, which is right about the time that the plants are growing and they need water the most and they're the most vulnerable and then it doesn't rain for a month. Um, and they don't like that. Um, so irrigation proved that it was a must. Um, weed competition was fierce and it exacerbated the water stress as well as the, the plants that I didn't fertilize. Um, I had a little bit of tropical storm damage from uh, Hurricane Dorian, but nothing um, Nothing too bad, but it did cause permanent changes to the growth form of some of the plants just from being pushed over in one direction for too long. Um, you know, drought, nutrient deficiency, and notably stink bugs, which are going to become a recurring problem. Um, and the stink bugs, the, the worst thing about them was that they would feed on the developing bulls and they would inject a bacterial bull rot you know, inadvertently. I don't think they're doing it on purpose, but I wouldn't put it past them, um, which would rot the fiber from the inside out. And so, and get to it. So this is what it would do. I'd get like one, the Sea Island cotton tends to be a, a three locule plant. So it's got three different um, sections of seed and fiber in it. Every once in a while, you get a four locule bowl on it. Um, but I'd get one that was good, one that was half rotten, and one that was just this, this disgusting, nasty, it wouldn't, it's the heebie -jeebies. It was that stinking sucker down there that was doing it. Additionally, if you don't get enough boron, it also causes the same problem. Um, so I wasn't off base with my roach killer. Um, sorshin was another issue I had. This is a fungal pathogen that's found in the soil. Um, uh, when you don't get enough water, this is able to get into the plant and infect the vascular cambrium and kind of strangle the plant and girdle it uh, while it's not able to grow. But if your plant is growing fast, the plant gets big enough, fast enough that it's not a problem. So this, this was cured just by providing ample irrigation and getting the plants up and out of the ground as fast as possible. Um, Hurricane Dorian bent some of the plants, but ultimately didn't do a lot of damage. I thought I was going to have like all of my plants stripped bare of leaves, but I didn't lose practically any. Um, so for this first year, because I didn't know what I was working with, I took excruciatingly detailed data um, on the entire process. You know, I was measuring each individual plant with a ruler every single week. Um, and tracking, you know, I, I put every every bowl I picked off went into an individual bag per plant at the end of the year. I measured and weighed all of it and separated everything just so I could, you know, see whether or not seed selection was something that needed to be done. Um, ultimately my the plants just did so inconsistently because of the terrible growing conditions that I didn't really pay too much attention to it, but I did only select from the best performers out of that. Um, 
Let me see, I actually had a really good germination rate. It was about 81% um, for the plant, for the seeds that I put at a quarter inch, it was 92%. Um, and of these plants, um, the average height was about 60 inches, so about here. And I had one plant that was 80 inches. And that's something about Sea Island and long staple cottons. They get tall. Um, if they're in the right growing conditions, as I've got a, another slide about that, these plants will get 10 foot tall if you let them. Um, they're not like modern upland cottons that get about you know, waist to chest high and then they croak. Um, these plants just keep growing. Like I said, they're a tropical perennial plant. They grow as a tree down in the Caribbean. Um, and see, that, that growth form is still present there in the Sea Island cotton. Um, what I learned from this is that I needed to make the beds shorter um, because the, the higher beds didn't really you know, provide all that much benefit with you know, modern cultivation techniques. Uh, I needed to add you know, just as much fertilizer, weed protection, and irrigation as any other modern crop. They didn't have any of that back then, which is why they didn't do it. It's not because they didn't need it, they just didn't have it. Um, and so all of those things would improve you know, my productivity significantly. Uh, the other problem I ran into is no one makes double roller cotton gins anymore. You can't just buy that <laughs> off of Amazon. Uh, so in order to process uh, all the cotton fiber, I had to design and build my own roller cotton gins uh, by reverse engineering patent drawings from the 1800s. Um, that, and I had to do all the processing um, in, in the, you know, the order necessary to do it. So the, I had to take the raw lint and dry it in linen bags for a couple of months in order to get rid of all the moisture, which is just a technical way of saying I left them in a crocus sack in my car for a couple of months um, <laughs> until I got around to actually doing this. Um, then I sorted the cotton, so I pick out all, you know, all, the, all the, you know, the, the rotten stained lint, the, the pieces of leaves, the bits of sticks, the dead stink bugs, et cetera, out of there. Um, and then while I was doing that, I also whipped the cotton, which is where I fluffed it up and shook out the dirt and everything. And this made it much easier to gin. At that point, I ginned them on my custom roller cotton gins. And then I mowed them, which is where you, where you go through after the fact. And everything that you managed to miss before you ginned it or any, any seeds that got crushed during the gin, ginning process, picked all that out. So this took a lot of time. Um, it's very <laughs> tedious, but I got watched a lot of TV. Um, so here is the, the eventual prototype gin that has never been finalized, but it's still sitting in my garage, um, that I used to process the cotton. Um, and so it's very similar to some of these historic patent drawings, but made out of the cheapest things I could get with the least tools I had available. Uh, I, eventually, I originally based this off of a sewing machine trail and had it running off of a, um, straight off of the sewing machine. And that actually worked pretty well, except I don't have the hand-eye coordination to do that, so I eventually switched to an electric motor. Um, but if this works, I have a quick little video of me here actually Ginning cotton gives me a convenient excuse to drink some water. And there's no sound, so if you can't hear it, that's because there's no sound. What are the rollers made of? Um, they're made out of maple, I believe. I had a guy custom make those um, and still need to do some improvements to finish the, the fit of it, and I just haven't gotten around to it. Yeah. Yeah. I thought about that too, but you can't get it fast enough. Make sure you don't get your fingers in there. I did that. <laughs> um, it hurts and it also dents the rollers, so I stopped doing that. Dented maple with your finger? Yeah, well, there, I got bones in there. <laughs> and so that's how it works. Um, it's not the cleanest, it's not the most elegant. But uh, for the volume of cotton I'm working with, uh, it worked very well. Um, I think this might be the first time I'm able to get through this entire presentation. Um, but so additionally, I also made this um, design here for anyone who wants to make their own roller gin. Um, so it's you can make it out of a, a two by four and a, and a one and a quarter inch dowel, and you know. <laughs> pack of wood screws. Um, it's not, it's, like I said, it's a very simple design. Uh, I've got this on our web, on the Edisto Island Open Land Trust website. Um, so if you go to edisto.org slash c-island-cotton, um, I've got that on there. We've got a write-up that's got the real basics of all of this on there as well. Um, uh, so in 2020, I doubled the size of my plot. I also left all the plants in the ground from 2019 because I wanted to see if I could grow them perennially, you know, like a confederate rose would. Um, but I also added more rows onto that. I also added some indigo in one row because I just wanted to play around with some indigo. Um, and then additionally, I also experimented with trap crops around it in order to you know, keep the stink bugs away. You know, plant, the whole concept with trap crops is you plant something 
nearby that is more highly favored by the pests. And you get them to use that, and then you come in, you get rid of that plant at a you know an opportune time, and then that really depletes your weed growth without having to spray things because if you you spray down the cotton for the stink bugs and you lose all the other beneficial insects and the stink bugs just come back, you know, in full force twice as heavy after that. So I was really trying to avoid that as much as I could um, because we have a, a lot of beneficial insects and a lot of pollinators out there in the Hutchinson house on account of the fact that I've got five acres of meadow right next to it that I'm managing for pollinator habitat. Uh, additionally, I started up a satellite plot um, at King's Market just down here. If you don't know, Rhett, Rhett and Bonnie King are my aunt and uncle. Um, so I was able to control my uncle in allowing me to plant some of this back behind the market. Uh, I plant, planted 70 plants in one singular row, and there is a photo of me with the plant about three foot over the top of me, and I'm six foot flat footed. Um, so those plants got big. Um, however, I made one terrible, critical mistake. I put all these cotton plants right between a weedy ditch and a row of zinnias and sunflowers which are the two things that sink bugs love the most. They sleep, they sleep in weedy ditches and they eat sunflowers. So every day there were two, there was two mass exoduses of, of stink bugs into and out of my cotton. And so I lost about 90% of my yield just from stink bugs. My plants look fantastic, um, but they were just dropping bowls left and right just, you know, from it, just an immune response to the sheer amount of bull rot they were getting. Um, additionally, I didn't put up a deer fence uh, at the Hutchinson house. That was a horrible mistake. Um, the, the deer didn't touch my plot the prior year, so I went, okay, I don't really need the deer fence. I need the deer fence. Um, they came in and the stinking hoof rats just bit the top off of every single plant every other week for about four months until I finally got a deer fence up and stopped. Um, so yeah, uh, but I also did fabric as well, and that ended up being a godsend. I didn't have to weed the plants anymore other than when they were young, just coming by and pulling the weeds that were growing up around the plants. Um, and I could also just run a push motor right down the alleys as well. And I didn't have to go out there and hand weed or use a machete or anything. Uh, in 2021, I pretty much just tried to do what I did the year before, but without, oh, I forgot to mention, the perennial plants absolutely did not work. Um, they just did not regenerate. I eventually, I pulled them up out of the ground in August and about 95% of the plants were still alive and only one of them had like put up leaves is the weirdest thing. So there's something about their perennial nature has gone haywire um, by being converted into you know, just an annual crop. Um, so unless you're growing them in like a greenhouse or in pots where they don't freeze, I don't think they have a proper freeze response. Um, so that went out the window. Let's see, I tried to do everything bigger and better in 2021 and I put up a deer fence and the deer busted through it and ruined everything again. Um, <laughs> And um, that was about the it. That was, that was it. I didn't make a crop in 2021. The deer ruined it. Uh, in 2022, I got serious. I ran in-bed irrigation. I improved the row geometry. I put down white landscape fabric across everything so I didn't have to do um, any weeding. Um, and I, I put down that fabric. It was a whole 500-foot roll of fabric with 600 9-inch sod staples. I did not expect this. Um, the irrigation and the weeds growing underneath the fabric worked like a million hydraulic jacks and picked the fabric up like the Michelin man coming out of the earth. Um, and eventually flipped the fabric over and just took over half of one of the rows. Uh, so I had to cut off the irrigation at the hottest time of the year to all of the plants just to kill the weeds. This is because I used the white landscape fabric instead of the black landscape fabric. The stuff I had the year prior had a felt liner. It was really good at suppressing the weeds. This let just enough light through that they didn't die and they didn't boil to death. And because they were constantly being supplied with water, they just like it. So anyway, um, so I learned not to do that. Uh, also, I had, it was an incredibly busy year at the land trust. And so I had to abandon them um, immediately after I shut off the irrigation. So I did not get out there to weed them and I wasn't able to get out there and harvest all of them. Um, in 2023, um, I put a lot of center blocks on the fabric and pretty much left everything exactly where it was to not disturb the weed bed, pulled the plants up, put them right back in the ground. I wasn't sure this was going to work just because I'm, you know, I'm planting in the same plot, I'm saying it's planting in the same space. It's probably not good as far as soil borne pathogens and you know, nutrient loading, but the plants actually did really well. Um, the only real issue I had is it was, again, it was an incredibly busy year and I just didn't have the time to get out there and pick them and tend to them, but they did very well on their own. Um, the one thing I did learn is that I was spraying weeds in the parking lot and it was a slightly windy day and it turns out the cotton is incredibly sensitive to either dicambra or 2,4-D 
um, herbicide. Don't know why, but it was like the, the faintest whiff. And they did this really strange strapping thing on just a couple of plants in the market. Didn't hurt the plants, didn't affect them long term, but just for a couple of weeks, they had weird leaves and weird flowers, and then it went away. So I'm no longer using that to get rid of the nut sedge growing up in the parking lot. Um, and yeah, um, I also have a, a lot of future plans for this project. Don't know if I will ever have the time to work on any of them. Um, but year six, we're going to be putting the plants back in the ground here. Um, I plant actually in the first week of May, the last week of April. Uh, the plants really like the heat, and they come up really fierce. I tried planting them early uh, to begin with, and they just sit there and don't do anything. They're like okra. You just you can wait till the last minute, put them in the ground, they're out the ground like a rocket. Um, uh, we're working on the historical interpretation outreach at the house right now, so this will be part of it. Um, this is going to be pretty much just a little demonstration plot. I'm not going to be planting the entire property in cotton. Um, you have to shoot me before I do that. Uh, I'm, it's hard enough managing a thousand square feet at the moment, um, let alone an acre. Um, I, potentially, there's a short book in the works. Uh, I started writing a manuscript, and I got page 17 was in the introduction still, so I figured probably should be a book. Um, uh, I keep thinking about uh, potential marketable products that the Land Trust could produce from this in order to, do, to fundraise for the Hutchinson House um, property, uh, but there's a lot of weird technical legal loopholes and stuff in there just with distributing cotton seed and everything, and that and I don't have the time. Um, I've collaborated with a couple of researchers in R&D departments who are looking into Sea Island Cotton Seed, but has any you know modern utility in you know for high performance clothing and that kind of stuff. Uh, I'd love to get into some partnerships with small farmers and other enthusiasts uh, to be able to you know get this plant grown at other historical sites and that kind of thing. Uh, and also, I need to find a use for the gin blend. Um, <laughs> so, uh, in order to hand spin Sea Island Cotton, you need immense skill. This is an incredibly fine fiber. Um, and so I don't have any skill, any skill and I don't have any equipment. Um, so I don't really have a way to spin or weave it. And I, I shudder every time I think about spending the time investment. Um, I know Lynn's helped me with that before in the past. Um, so it, machine spinning and weaving is probably the only practical way I'm going to be able to analyze what this fiber actually has as a capability. Um, people keep promising to send me, you know, technical data when I give them cotton, and then they never return my phone calls, so I've stopped giving cotton to people. Um, <laughs> at this point, I probably have enough fiber produced to make a handkerchief, maybe two, depending on the size of the handkerchief. So it has not been a pr particularly um, productive plant yet, just due to lack of my ability to pick it and the stink bugs and hooked rats. Um, there's still many other um, topics for further research in this project. Um, that Seabrook session I mentioned, I don't know if anyone has their hands on that yet, but that's potentially another probably nearly identical strain of Sea Island cotton right here from Edisto Island that would be really good to look at. And you just have to be able to grow these things in isolation so that they don't inter interbreed and hybridize, you know, just to keep them straight. Well, I guess you could. There's a... <laughs> Seed selection is the other thing. Um, you know, this has been kind of just the the USDA just kind of just had them in a vault. They take them out every 10 years. They tie the flowers shut. They let them self-pollinate. They get more seeds. They put them back in the freezer. Um, so there really hasn't been any seed selection in the last 80 or so years. We don't know how many generations they had of these at Florence and at Johns Island before these things went into you know, um, storage. Um, so who knows what the fiber quality is like. This is probably only from like one batch of cotton seeds. We don't know what the genetic diversity of this crop is. Um, <coughs> Uh, additionally, it would be interesting to see how perennial plants perform like in a greenhouse setting, uh, whether or not they revert back to a wild type the longer they grow like that. You know, something like uh, Chinese hollies are, are a good example of that. You plant them and they have this nice smooth leaf, and the older they get and the more they get pruned, they start turning into these horrible scraggly spiny things. Um, that might happen with cotton plants if you grow them for several years as a perennial. We don't know. I don't know if anyone's ever done that. Um, invisible steriliz sterilization of the seed within the bowl is another thing I want to look at because I emailed the USDA and I was like, or I emailed Clemson Extension and I was like, hey, I want to sell cotton wreaths for fundraising. And then they were like, you can't distribute cotton seed. So <laughs> apparently every cotton wreath that you see sold in the state is illegal. Um, so I had to open my mouth and ask. And so now I have to figure out a way to kill the seeds inside the bowl without ruining the bowl if I ever want to do that. So that's a whole other rabbit hole. You can microwave them apparently, it works. Um, <laughs> Uh, I still need to get some technical analysis done on the existing fiber characteristics to know just exactly what we're dealing with and how it compares to modern cottons. Um, I still need to make tons of improvements to my cotton gins. They've, I'm not growing enough cotton at this point in time for it to really be necessary, but 
I would like to have the gin at a point where that is no longer the limiting factor is how fast it takes to process this. Um, uh, additionally, um, I don't know if mechanical harvest can ever become feasible. This plant has really tight-knit bowls. They have to be hand-picked. Um, modern upland cottons are at the point now where they just kind of just fluff up and you, they basically just run industrial lint rollers down the field and just pull the fibers right out of the plants. These, you have to physically get in there and grab them and pull them out of the plant. Um, it's like pulling a tick off a dog. It's a bad, bad analogy, but you know, it's the very precise and it takes a, a lot of effort. Um, so I don't know if they can ever be mechanically harvested. Um, additionally, um, it would be really great to get a more robust genetic analysis done on this plant to just know where it's at, whether or not there's any kind of hybridization going on. I provided some seeds to some guys who said they were going to do that, but it was a startup. I don't know if they're going bankrupt or not. Um, so maybe we'll get some of that here eventually. And so with a few parting words, um, or conclusions and takeaways, Sea Island cotton is extinct no more, probably. Um, caveat. Um, uh, it's being grown on Edisto Island and it's still being grown at my McLeod Historic Site on James Island. Um, it's integral to our interpretation of our history here in the Low Country, and its cultivation comes with a unique host of challenges. And I have some parting preemptive answers. Uh, this is not a business venture, nor am I marketing any products. Uh, I'm not looking for investors. I'm not looking for business partners. I'm not looking for job offers. I'm not selling fabric. I'm not selling thread. I'm not selling lint. You can't pay me to grow cotton. I don't have any time. I don't have any land. I don't have any equipment. Uh, but if you would like to support the project, you can volunteer or donate with the SLI and Open Land Trust, and please designate the tractor fund. Um, <laughs> um, additionally, um, I, I, I will not sell, give, or trade cottonseed, because under South Carolina state law and the bull we will quarantine, it is illegal for me to do that. Um, there are proper channels to become a seed distributor that can distribute this kind of thing. It's a lot of work. I looked into it yesterday. I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to do that. I would rather not go to jail. Um, so the, the strain that I am growing is not proprietary. This is public property. This is owned by the USDA at the College Station, tech, or the College Station um, Lab in Texas. Um, this is being maintained by the USDA for the benefit of the, the US public. And so any researcher can order these seeds direct from the USDA. So if you have a bona fide research use and you need to get your hands on these, that option is there. Um, it's public property. That's it. What do you do for share time? <laughs> James. Uh, is there any historical data based on the production of sea island cotton per acre as compared to the upland cotton? Um, Porsche covers a lot of that in his book. Um, I'm a little iffy on his numbers and how accurate they are. Um, I have records. Um, from USDA census data uh, from Henry Hutchinson, and they don't line up with the numbers that Porsche reports. Um, I think it's about 100 to 200 pounds of processed lint per acre um, per year. Um, modern upland cottons are some ridiculous amount, like seven or 900. Yeah. Um, but a lot of stuff is like historic stuff is reported, like it being like, you know three to five hundred pounds on the best land on Edisto. I think that was unprocessed seed cotton. There's, I, I can't see how in, in 50 years it dropped so dramatically. Two follow-ups. One is uh, when, when sea island cotton first started being produced, obviously they didn't have the scientific data that you had available to the soil sampling and everything yeah. else. What kind of products did they use for fertilization? Was it natural animal products? Yes. Um, originally, there wasn't. Um, they, didn't, they didn't require much in the way of, say, like micronutrient fertilization. Um, but historically, we have a, a lot of accounts of people putting down things like wood ashes, pine straw, cow manure. Uh, and the thing that gets talked about a lot is the use of fluff mud. Um, so that was actually pioneered all the way back in the 1790s up here in Megan, um, and it's, it was still used. Fluff mud is great because it's it's. If you don't know, Pluff Mud is 25% water, 25% air, 25% soil, and 25% muck. And so it, it's pretty much just a, a mix of sediments that are being washed downstream, as well as uh, marsh grass that has decomposed into organic matter. So it makes a really good both compost and micronutrient fertilizer. Um, after the Industrial Revolution, they were using, I know they were using guano as well as crushed um, potassium rock. Um, but real early on, it was just all organic fertilizers, whatever they could scrounge around. Well, the has a high salt content. Yep. 
Um, C. Allen Khan actually is fairly tolerant of, of high salinity. Um, and on these, these extremely well-drained sandy soils, they put the plug mud out there and you know, they do this you know, in like January or February. And by the time they were planting the cotton in, in April, it was our, all the salt was already washed out. Last, last one, I'll let somebody else have up, sorry. Uh, cross, how do they cross pollinate from the Seattle cotton to the upward cotton? Um, well, the. Or is it, is it airborne cross pollination? Or is it. Their cotton is all um, insect pollinated. Um, in the USDA laboratories, they were doing this mechanically. They were going in with paintbrushes or going in there with tweezers and pulling off anthers and going in back with a paintbrush and putting stuff on there. Um, <clears throat> In the you know actual on the farm setting, it was all just they they had a I think they had a four year rotation cycle. They would go out to the field, they would find the best plants, only take seeds from that. They'd grow you know a small plot of just the best seeds, fine tune that, pick the best performing plants out of that. They'd plant about an acre the next year, or about five acres the next year, and then the ten acres the next year, or however much seed they were able to produce. And so that it was. They were continually selecting the plants on, I think, about a four-year rotation, and they would increase it by an order of magnitude every single year. Um, but it was just, they just put all the really good plants in one spot and just let them do their own thing there. And as long as you didn't have insects moving to and from the property, I think really only honeybees are the only thing that moves around that much. Um, all of our native pollinators stay in pretty much one centralized location. Um, so there wasn't too much of an issue with cross-pollination. That They just weren't. They weren't doing it very technical. Um, Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Who else? You back there. Uh, do you have tours of the plants? Like once you get everything going in the summer, fall, do you allow people to come and yeah. see them um, and see your crop? Forgot to mention that. Um, so we, we have a parking lot at the Hudson House right now. Um, eventually, it's going. the grounds are just going to be open to the public. The plants are right next to the parking lot. Okay. So you can just pull up right there. You don't have to get out of your car. You can just look right out. OK, thanks. So um, James. <laughs> Didn't they use moisture shields as a calcium supplement? I wouldn't doubt it. Um, there's our, we actually have a lot of just calcium as a raw nutrient here in the soils. You go down deep enough anywhere in the island, you find oyster shell. Um, as far as a, a pH amender, um, I can't recall any use of raw oyster shell. But I know that they knew how to make quick lime out of it by burning it, so it wouldn't surprise me one bit. Um, My competitive nature wants to know how I fall was doing against the John Allen fall. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, John's Island likes to say they had the best cotton, but if you look at the, the numbers and, and everyone who won awards, they all happen to be from Edistones. <laughs> yes, what was the manual process like for those that were asleep? processing of the actual like picking out pennies they didn't have yeah. gin and all that so what was that like um what did they have um, to do in order to prepare to be shipped? so let me zoom back here way to the beginning um so pretty much all the processing was done in the gin house so that kind of acted like a clean room i, mean, I gotta hold up you gotta give me a second here i gotta scroll all the way back up here to this photo of henry i've got so they would pull the bowl off the plant, get it back mm -hmm. to the gen house, so and then the, the field off. hands would pick the individual locules out of the fibers, put it into a bag, and then they would bring that back to a sort of centralized location in the field. That would then all be collected into a larger bag, brought to the gin house, and then at the gin house, there were people whose jobs were just to process the, the cotton fiber there in the gin house. So that was, now if you see right here, this. This is the gin house that Henry Hutchinson improved at the house. Um, and so that he, his gym actually bought, was already there at Clark Manor and they just renovated it. It was in disrepair at the time. Um, and so this, all the processing took place there. They kept the dust out. People walk, washed their hands, washed their feet before they went in there. Um, and so there were different, I think it was usually a two to two and a half story building. And so ginning would be done on the second floor. Processing would be done all the way at the top. Um, and they would also have, um, they would usually have loading rooms where they would hang bags from the ceiling and folks would cram cotton in there. Someone would be standing in the bag, tamping the cotton down so they could pack as much into a bale as they possibly could. Um, but it was, it was all done by hand. Back then they had, it's hard to find good records. There probably, there probably was a lot of different ways that they, they ran the gins back then, but it was pretty much, they had small gins about the size of the one I had, a little bit bigger. 
um, and they would either have an individual person running a treadle, feeding the gin, or someone running a treadle while someone else fed it. Um, and then it or some places they had a centralized, um, since we didn't really have water power down here, they would have a mule in the center turning a common axle that would spin a whole bank of gins. And then there would be an individual person at each gin doing the ginning. And so there would be a different person at each step doing each different type of processing work. So, yes? Why, again, is it illegal to sell a cotton rate? Um, it's illegal to distribute seeds or live plants because the boll weevil quarantine is still in effect in South Carolina. So if people just give out cotton seeds and then they plant them in their yard and then we have a boll weevil outbreak, there's, there are cotton plants on the landscape that the USDA does not know about. And so these these would potentially get infected with the boll weevil. No one would know it's there. They could go through, eradicate the boll weevil all throughout all the you know, planted fields, because the USDA monitors every single cotton feed in, field in the state of South Carolina. And so if you just had someone with five plants in their backyard that had boll weevils in them, and the USDA just went in and spent millions of dollars to, to clear out the boll weevil from all these fields, it would just come right back out of there. But a cotton yeah. rate, it's just the cotton. The seeds are in the bowl. It's got the bowl with the seed? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so it's the, the actual wreath is just the, the raw bowl cut right off the plant. It hasn't been processed, hasn't been ginned. So it, it's, a, it's a gray area. Um, thousands of people sell cotton wreaths in the state. No one arrests them. I'm sure the, most of the USDA folks have one on their wall behind their office. But I open my mouth and I ask. So now, now, they are, now they're aware I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Denzel. Um, so you said sea island cotton wasn't really developed until like the 1790s, mm -hmm. right? Was yeah. it all staple or upstate, like primarily planted in the low country? And like how did that? So there were two things happening in parallel. Um, during the, before the Revolutionary War, the big upland crop down here was either corn or indigo. Um, our main buyer of indigo was England. Um, because they needed indigo and they were currently at war with everyone else who produced indigo. Um, and so they were paying a premium for the, the, the kind of discount colonial indigo that we were able to produce here in the, in the colonies that did much better in the tropics. Um, and then we proceeded to go to war with England. And then so they stopped paying us an exorbitant price for our indigo. So people stopped growing indigo. And now no one really had anything to grow on the uplands other than cows and corn. And so People were experimenting with both upland cotton and long staple cotton throughout, you know, after indigo kind of died down as well as a little bit before that. They were experimenting with growing cotton. But the limiting factor with upland cotton is they had no way to gin it. So they would feed it into a roller gin and it would just smash the thing. It was a complete waste of time. Long staple cotton, they couldn't get a crop out of it because it wasn't day neutral yet. And so they had upland cotton was could be grown, could be grown well, did really well. They had no way to get fiber out of it other than people sitting there and individually pulling the seeds out of it. Long staple cotton, they had a way to process it. They had land, they knew it grew well, it wouldn't produce a crop. And so kind of simultaneously, um, Sea Island cotton had its day neutrality beat out of, out of it in the, the early 1790s. And then in 1793, the saw chain was invented by Eli Whitney. And so both, both crops took off simultaneously in different parts um, sea Island cotton here in the low country and upland cotton in the Midlands kind of in parallel. Um, anyone else? I need a clarification. You, you yes, talked sir. about upland cotton, cotton and how the machines will practically strip the fiber out of the bowl as it goes along. Yeah. Was that when they were, when they were going to Sea Island cotton? Did the people pick it yet? Did they pull it out in the field, or did they just pull the bowl off and go back to um, a separate place to be separated? In, in the antebellum period, as well as through the sharecropping period and all that, it was all picked by hand. So yeah. it was not, yeah. But is, is the fiber separated from the... No, no, no. When the harvester goes through, it just <clears throat> pulls the fiber, or pulls the entire locule, seed, fiber, everything out, and then that goes to the gen. Okay, and that's how so, they yeah. did it. Then too, they pull the whole thing. Yeah. Off. So the only the only thing that the mechanical harvesting did is it just it, people no longer had to hand pick the cotton in the field. Yeah. Right. Are you saying that they picked the entire bowl, or did they? Pick no, the uh, sorry, the the, the locules itself. Trying to find out. Did you put this? I picked yeah. cotton. 
Yeah. No, they they. People, yeah. So no, people picked the the seed cotton out of the bowl and then brought back to the jet. Unless you want to cheat and get more money and then get your sack heavier than you. Put a rock in it. Don't ask me. Yes, sir. Two more, two questions. You mentioned sulfur. You you trying to get a certain pH with that? Uh, no, uh, just down here on the coast, our sandy soils are naturally deficient in sulfur. Um, okay. In the topsoil, you go out in the pluff mud, it's like it's blooming with sulfur. Um, that was actually another thing that was this, the, the pluff mud was really good for is it has a lot of sulfides in it. Um, it's just cotton is a sulfur sensitive plant, and the sulfur and nitrogen tend to wash out of our sandy soils here. So okay. if you don't have a good organic layer, you have to supply sulfur and nitrogen as well. Um, they're not mineral nutrients they're kind of they're floating in the atmosphere um, so they will boil out of the soil over time if conditions aren't correct nitrogen you know evaporates and, and um, sulfur will as well um, so there's they just have more with sulfur fuels right yeah and we don't have that anymore <laughs> no. the other question i have was well I, actually hold up how, how did they how did they move this material around i mean i'm, I'm assuming the market was in charleston was that all by boat it's all by boat so that steamboat I was talking about, the, the steamboat company that Jim Hutchinson founded, that was the only way to get market stuff to Charleston. It's either you loaded it on a boat and you took it up the Stono all the way to Charleston Market, or you put it on a horse on a cart, you drug it all the way, and scroll down to that, you drove it all the way up the public road to Old Dominion, drug it across a float bridge to cross a took it all the way from down here, you'd have to drive it all the way up here to Old Dominion, over to Jahasi, land it here, get it on the ferry, take it over to the Grove, and then haul it by horse all the way to Charleston Market if you want to go by land. So it was much easier to just float stuff up the river to Charleston. Um, and that's how everything got on and off of uh, Edisto Island up until the 1920s. Steamboat. A steamboat? Yep. They, it's called Steamboat Landing for a reason. Um, and I had, I had one, quick, one quick tangent on that. Um, you actually don't, you need less sulfur nowadays. Um, than you did historically uh, because of acid rain. So now rain just contains sulfur now. Um, so the actual quantity, it's, it's a silver lining, you know, headstones <laughs> melt, um, but at the same time, there's sulfur in rainwater now. So there's actually like mild fertilization for sulfur here on the sea island. So there's less sulfur limitation than there would have been historically. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all for having me.